you. Thank you, guys. Good morning. Um, my name is Alex Gardner, as uh, Brian mentioned. Before we get into the discussion, I did want to say a very, very quick thank you to Nick and Brian. Uh, this is easily my favorite event of the entire year, so thrilled to be here again. Um, not only is it a great event, it also uh, is really enjoyable because it combines two of my personal passions, which is uh, skiing and smoking wheat. Um, I'm, I'm, I'm totally joking, I'm totally joking. I'm, I'm not a very good skier. Um, so, uh, Alex Gardner, I oversee uh, the sell side of our business globally at Index Exchange. Um, and for those of you who may not be familiar, Index provides programmatic solutions for media sellers across display, video, mobile. And I'm thrilled to be joined today uh, by one of our newest partners, uh, Daniel Bornstein from Demand. And Daniel, perhaps you could introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about uh, Demand. Absolutely. Good morning, everyone. Uh, for those of you who may not be familiar with uh, Demand Media, we are a group of federated companies that operate in high passion verticals across e-commerce and content and media. I'm here representing the content and media side. You see some of our brands up on the screen. You've probably heard of them. We are a top 20 uh, entity within Comscore on an ad-supported basis. And uh, as Alex said, uh, we're very entrenched in all aspects of digital. So for a guy like me who's been really focused on programmatic for a number of years now, um, I think demand's been a pretty interesting study for a number of reasons. They've made a number of really, really bold moves strategically uh, in the space uh, since you know, inception back in 2006. But it was two years ago um, that they really caught my attention and grabbed a number of headlines when they announced uh, publicly that they were doing away with their entire sales organization. Um, and that was no small move at the time. That was about 90 people who were generating, obviously, very, very meaningful revenue for the organization. Um, and they, they decided to relinquish that, that entire org in favor for an entirely automated, uh, programmatic, guaranteed strategy. Um, and remember, this was two years ago, so still relatively early on in the programmatic, uh, in the programmatic realm. Um, so I think I'd like to start there, Daniel. Um, recognizing that you inherited this strategy, I'm interested to know sort of what led to this decision and, and what motivated it, and also sort of where you guys are at today, because I think my understanding is that you've, you've kind of come back a little bit from that initial approach. Sure, I, I don't know if I would say come back as much as, um, I mean, you really touched on three things here, three words, cost, efficiency, and automation, and as, as you rightly said, I wasn't within the organization when they made that decision, but those were the catalysts, the, key, the keywords, if you will, and, and ultimately, I think it was the right decision, because when, the digital landscape is evolving very, very quickly. We all know that. And ultimately, you need a first mover. Mm -hmm. So as a first mover, and there have been many articles published about demand media being a pioneer in the programmatic space, there's pros and there's, there's cons. Some people wait on the sidelines, and they, they see how the chips fall. And then they get in, and they have very little risk. So while we were able to gain uh, a lot of benefit from it, for example, we have literally thousands of private, private marketplaces set up that are active with a multitude of DSPs and buyers. There was also this notion of waiting for the market to catch up. But to your point, 90 salespeople is a lot of salespeople. And, and for anybody who's ever managed a sales organization, probably four out of 10 salespeople hit their goals. Um, unless you're in an order taking organization. Uh, some of you maybe have worked for one. I have. Uh, so that's a little bit of a, of, of a different animal. Um, so it was, it was interesting for us, but at the end of the day, I think what we all know is that programmatic is not set it and forget it. You need to have practitioners who are on the ground who are optimizing it, but you also need to have some level of brand evangelism out in the market. And that's really where we are today. It's sort of finding that middle road and, and waiting for the market to catch up, but at the same time doubling down on programmatic on a continual basis. So as we mentioned, it was, it was a very, very bold strategy at the time. Um, no doubt a very interesting experience for you guys. I'm curious if you can dig in a little bit to what you learned, what worked, what didn't, and where you guys are at today with your, your sales strategy. Sure. So, so what worked, frankly, was this notion of being a first mover and learning from our mistakes. Um, and, and when we think about programmatic, um, at dinner last night we were talking about this notion of people in our industry speaking in acronyms. And the more you engage in acronyms, the less you probably even understand what's going on. And I think that the number one buzzword of the last three years essentially has been programmatic. Programmatic 
has a, it's definitionally a little bit different for everyone, right? So today people call programmatic anything that is the automation of buying and selling media, including open exchange and RTB in general. We don't think of it in that way. We think of it as being uh, either A, private marketplace, or B, uh, programmatic guaranteed or programmatic direct. Mm -hmm. um, and so I think that's the opportunity for us because we thought that this notion of programmatic guaranteed and programmatic direct was going to be a windfall for us and in fact, it wasn't because the market is still to some extent catching up. So we made a lot of inroads in the private marketplace sector, if you will. And as a result, in the absence of a robust programmatic direct market, you still need to have direct salespeople to, to fill those gaps. Because to, to the extent that there is an IO-based business out there, we need to be in the game as well. So let, let's dig into that <clears throat> excuse me, a little bit further. Um, I'm curious to know, and, and uh, the former speaker CEO of Bloomberg, I think, said it. Um, best, certainly from my opinion, which is that um, if it can go programmatic, it will go programmatic. Yep. Um, but I think we all agree that there's definitely a role for the salesperson in yes. today's environment. Tell me a little bit about what that role entails and what it means for, for you guys. Sure. So, so when I started, we basically had a series of quote-unquote salespeople that were operating in every space. Uh, programmatic, direct, sponsored, and so on and so forth. And they were also operating across properties. I think what we're seeing today when you look at the, the huge platform plays like the Googles and the Facebooks and the so on, they're the only true scale players out there, right? Even Demand Media is the 20th largest entity on an ad-supported basis within Comscore. I would argue we're not, a, uh, we're not a scale play. So the notion of accentuating a unique value pro proposition across properties, and we have properties that are in the humor, health, and wellness, and sort of do-it-yourself space, um, you need to have people that are accentuating those unique value propositions. So that's, that was something that was very important to me and very important to demand media. And at the same time, if we look at it on a channel basis, so direct versus programmatic in, in this instance, today our programmatic salespeople are separate salespeople, and they're really a mixture between business development professionals and technical special, specialists. So mm -hmm. Not only can they evangelize the, the virtues, extol the virtues of programmatic, but they know their, their way around an SSP. Yep. Our direct salespeople are very much focused on pushing forward the brand. This is Live Strong. We're the fourth largest health and wellness property in the US with a number one site for healthy living. And here's why you should be on our property. And of course, as part of that is this notion of sponsored content. So it sounds to me like you haven't approached a scenario where there's been a blurring of the lines. Um, it's still pretty clear between programmatic and direct sales, um, but they're there to support each other, essentially. Is that safe to say? That, that is safe to say. And, and I think you know, where we are now, we need to focus on, on channel and we need to focus on property, but we also need to be nimble and we also need to understand that the industry is changing every year and we need to be nimble and change along with it. So this notion of 90 salespeople, that's a pretty marked organizational change. But when you have an organization that is nimble and, in fact, the blurring happens because within the grouping level, everybody lives on the same team. Everybody shares best practices. Programmatic and, and direct salespeople work together. Native salespeople work together. So at whatever point, quote unquote, the industry catches up and program, programmatic direct is the only ways and means of trading impression-based inventory, we'll be able to adapt to that quite easily because our, our team is small, nimble, and coordinated. So to switch gears for a moment, I'm curious to know the impact that programmatic has had on your direct sales. I'd like to know how those two, so we understand the, the sort of coordination between yep. uh, direct sales teams and programmatic teams, but talk to me a little bit about how it's affecting it from a sort of a sales revenue standpoint. Sure. Well, just picking back off the point I, I made a moment ago, when you have all of these things living within the same organization, you can be and you should be agnostic. And at the end of the day, the thing that's most important to us, apart from user experience and advertiser satisfaction, is, of course, yield. Mm -hmm. right? That's why we're in the game. <clears throat> we're not a non-for-profit. Um, and we look at it, when we look at it through that lens, really everything has an equal priority. And that, that's kind of the question that I was going to lead to next, which is, you know, have you, have you distinguished in terms of the channels through which uh, buyers can access the inventory? Is there a prioritization of one over the other, or is it fairly level? It's, it's totally level. Um, at the end of the day, if an impression through header bidding comes in at $15 CPM and a direct sales campaign comes in at $13 CPM, 
Obviously, that partner who is willing to pay more for that premium in inventory will win. I'm the and first generation of my family that One of the reasons I was particularly excited to get you on stage yeah. with, uh, with us today, um, we had a conversation a couple weeks in New York, and you, you mentioned this, this idea of, of tension or pricing pressure yeah. uh, that is starting to emerge between uh, programmatic and, and direct. Um, and I think that's, that's a, a stark sort of departure from what we heard about not too, too long ago, this race to the bottom. Obviously, we're well past that. But tell me how, how the, the two are sort of uh, relating and, and the relationship between those, those two channels today for you guys. Sure, uh, absolutely. I, I think when, when programmatic sort of came to the fore, uh, again, there was different definitions and people looked at it at, at its virtues differently. I always looked at it as, as a channel. And from the publisher perspective, I looked at it as a mid-tier CPM, right? So lower than remnant. I'm sorry, a lot higher than remnant and, and, and lower than direct. Um, but really, it shouldn't be a mid-tier CPM. It should just be a CPM based on the value of set impression. And this is where we're starting to see movement now over the last year, where on a programmatic basis, those CPMs are higher. And as a result, we are constantly, again, going back to the same point of having everybody on the same team, our analysts are constantly looking at the pressures the upward pressures in this instance, not a race to the bottom that programmatic is providing. And as such, we're adjusting on a monthly basis our rate cards because at a certain point in time, again, going back, going back to the notion of 90 salespeople, you don't need 90 salespeople if you get a CPM that's on par. Yeah, and I, th I think the, the sort of mechanism or the point of implementation has contributed towards this upward pressure. Yes. Uh, and that, of course, is header tag. We haven't heard a whole lot about it so far. If we had the, uh, usually we do this, this uh, um, jargon bingo. We haven't done it this year. I don't know what's going on. Um, but I'll say it again. Header tag has become a big part of, of, of the, the strategy today. Um, tell me a little bit about how that's affecting your business, how you've decided to sort of embrace that as a, a mechanism, and is it working for you? So uh, first of all, early days, uh, it is working for us. Here's the plug for index. Uh, the reason why we chose index and we did a mini RFP and we evaluated a lot of header bidding partners was in part uh, because they were a, a technology-focused, media-agnostic solution. And I think that's very, very important. Um, I will get on my soapbox here for a minute for all the publishers in the room. I know you know the IAB statistic that we're getting 45 cents of every dollar and intermediaries are getting 55 cents of every dollar. If that doesn't infuriate you, it should. And header bidding is our opportunity to get closer to the advertiser. And frankly, that's what the advertisers want as well. So probably most of you know this, but in a waterfall, where you're constantly rearranging the deck chairs and giving partners priority based on a hunch or based on more art than science. Header bidding allows our yield optimization specialists to focus more on the science and less on the art and understand what the true value of our inventory is. Yeah, no, I think that's fantastic to hear. And I think that the value exchange isn't one-sided there by any means with respect to header. Um, I think for the first time this quarter, we will have seen um, the proportion of spend via header versus traditional tag base um, you know, be weighted towards a uh, header, um, not to mention the increasing CPMs, which are really substantial through that channel, and also the speed, which is now accelerating or above that of, of traditional tag-based implementations. Um, the other, I guess, shiny object in the space uh, these days is, is the wrapper, of course. Right. Um, and, and that is, is another sort of layer to the strategy. Tell us a little bit about how you've approached that one. So the way that we look at the wrapper is pretty simple, right? He header bidding as, as a conceit. Is, is about putting you know, code on page, right? And, and the more code you put on the page, our GM of uh, eHow is here, and, and certainly latency for, for any site owner is a hot button issue. So that's, that's also part of it. And the other part of it is, of course, less is more. We want to avoid a situation that we had however many years ago where you just had an unlimited amount of partners and the demand was duplicating itself. So that's one aspect of it. Having one unified partner that can take these different solutions and included in a wrapper or a container is more advantageous because at the end of the day, we're going to have less partners and we want to have one uniform way of managing it. So we're very excited about that. We're very excited that ad tech companies are starting to work together um, and demand sources are starting to work together and, and going into uh, containers. I'll, I'll close out here with, with the impossible question. Um, your responsibility is overseeing revenue monetization uh, across all your properties. Um, what are you thinking about in a year, two years, five years from now? Well, with 17 seconds, that's a hard question uh, <laughs> to answer. But uh, what I would say, if I'm just looking in broad strokes, I think we're going to continue to see the automation on impression-based inventory. 
um, whether that be uh, programmatic PMPs or be programmatic direct, and we're looking forward to embracing those efficiencies in automation, and I think we're gonna see a parallel path of, of creativity and something we haven't spoken about, but our company's deeply engaged in as well, is this notion of sponsored content. So you'll have automation, you'll have creativity and sponsored content, and you'll have a, a small, finite amount of brand evangelists who know how to talk about that in the marketplace, and that's what's gonna happen over the next few years. Brilliant, well thank you so much. I, I think we're out of time. I don't know if we have time for questions, Brian, at all. Um, but if we do, I, I'd love to open it up. For myself or Brian, uh, or Daniel. Or me. Or you. <laughs> Nothing about header tags, though, please. <laughs> uh, any questions? All right, cool. Thank you so Thanks, much. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Appreciate it.